on the phone, David Dayen, writer for just about everyone, as far as I can tell, uh, but talking about um, uh, net neutrality in his piece in The New Republic, Sad But True, The Only Way to Save the Open Internet Requires Sucking Up to Corporate Titans. David, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. All right, so David, let's let's go through this and and walk people through the history uh, of 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 net neutrality. When we say net neutrality, we basically mean that there is no discrimination between one service that travels through the internet pipes, as it were, um, uh, versus another. Let's before we uh, catch up with the the latest proposal by Tom Wheeler, the mm-hmm the former uh, chief lobbyist for the telecom industry, or one of, um, and now FCC ahead. Let's, let's go back. Let's travel back in time, uh, shall we, to 1996. Um, what, uh, what happened in 96 that uh, implicates where we are today? Well, uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 came out, and uh, it offered a way for the FCC to label broadband Internet, which at the time wasn't really a a large contributor in in the Internet space. Most of us still had dial-up back in 1996. But uh, what this would do is it offered a path for the FCC to classify broadband Internet as a common carrier service. And what that means is it's no different from your telephone. Uh, When we're talking about the phones, you cannot, as a a phone provider, telephone provider, you cannot discriminate between one call coming through and another call. Uh, It's a common carrier. It's basically a utility. It's it's like the, the pipes that go to your house and provide you with water from the local reservoir. Uh, or or whatever it is. So there was an opportunity there. In 2002, uh, Michael Powell, uh, who was the head of the FCC at the time, he's Colin Powell's son, he's now a a major telecom lobbyist. Uh, You're noticing a pattern here because Tom Wheeler, who is now the head of the FCC, used to be a major telecom lobbyist. Uh, Michael Powell in 2002 said that Broadband Internet is not a, a, a common carrier service. It is not a utility. It is an information service. There's a two-way conversation going on. There, is, there are additional things that uh, an Internet service provider provides. And at the time, what he was talking about uh, was things like email uh, that usually you, know, you would get at the time an email address from your Internet service provider. Sometimes you still do. Uh, or uh, other various uh, factors that turned it into an information service. And that meant that the, uh, the anti-discrimination statutes under the Telecommunications Act weren't necessarily available to broadband Internet uh, because it wasn't labeled in this fashion as a common carrier service. So we had, we had two classifications. One was telecommunications services as a common carrier. The other is information services. And, you know, we should note, right. you know, in 1996, it was, it was, I think it was AOL and CompuServe. And, um, right. it, it, you know, to, to contemplate communication uh, in the way that we have it today in 96 was very hard. I mean, you know, you, you dial up and, yeah. you know, if you were lucky, you'd be able to Completely click on one link in a, in a matter of 45 minutes, I think it was. And you'd, you'd read a story and you'd be <laughs> amazed that we are in the future. Um, so we, now, now, prior to 2002, was uh, was it considered essentially a, a common carrier, or was it just sort of uh, nebulous? Yeah, there weren't rules that were written just yet, so uh, the ability existed at the time for uh, you know discrimination on on various content and toll booths uh, set up on the internet basically by internet service providers t- charging content producers to get their sites loaded faster but at the time as you said it, there was AOL there was CompuServe there there were GeoCity sites there weren't that many things that took a long time to load we didn't have video on the internet in large uh, 
measure until 2004, 2005. There, there just weren't there weren't a lot of real uses uh, for internet service providers to say I'm not going to load your website uh, fast enough. It just it just wasn't as critical. And by 2002, those things had advanced to the point where you could see a more critical uh, issue here. The other issue was is that the, the Internet service provider space wasn't as, as concentrated uh, at that time as it, as it is today. I mean, when you're talking about the Internet service provider, you're talking about uh, that your, who you pay for your Internet connection. And right now, that's largely uh, Comcast and AT&T and, and maybe Verizon. And that's pretty much it uh, across the country. I mean, I, I remember having a, a, a in in previous years a very uh, uh, you know, localized uh, internet service provider that that uh, was not a big company. Uh, but today, because you have this concentration, the there's far more possibility for an ISP to charge for content, make a load of money off it, and to have that have a real impact because if you're Netflix uh, and Comcast says you have to pay for to reach these subscribers, you're, you're paying to reach millions of subscribers rather than tens of thousands or however many uh, in, in, a more, uh, in a less concentrated world. And so back in, in 2007, um, and, and, you know, the, the idea of net neutrality started gaining traction uh, maybe, maybe back in 2004 or 2005. I'm not really sure exactly when it cropped up, but, yeah. I, but I do recall that in 2007, uh, Barack Obama at a, I think it was an MTV forum, was specifically yeah. asked an MTV forum. I think uh, that maybe Move On was involved. I can't quite remember, but was specifically asked about this concept uh, of net neutrality, and he went on to speak um, rather eloquently and specifically about the concept of net neutrality, and said this is absolutely essential to the development and the sort of the democratic nature of of the internet and uh so this was something that he really explicitly vowed uh to promote and he came in and um his first fcc chair uh julius uh and help me here with his last name because i i can't janikowski janikowski uh people anticipated that uh he would basically reclassify the uh, right. Internet as a as telecommunications as a common carrier, because of just how important it has become, certainly then and and even more so now to the everyday functioning of people's lives. Absolutely, and and he was very eloquent about that, and all of these problems with with regulating. Uh, in this space to ensure no discrimination on content on the Internet, all of it goes away if you just reclassify to a common carrier service. All of it. Uh, if you try to shoehorn regulations through this information service classification, you're inevitably going to come up with problems. So Janikowski's first stab at this uh, he went. He did not reclassify. He went through information service. There was a lawsuit, and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a very conservative court of appeals, uh, agreed with Verizon, who was the, the company that sued in this case, that you could not do what you, you know, you could not satisfy this, this net neutrality if you did not reclassify under the current classifications under the current statutes uh, it was not available as as in as something that could be done and so and specifically the they were using to sections to the drawing board. And, and specifically they're using se section 706 right I mean that was the sort of the mm -hmm. the provision that they wanted to try and use the authority granted to them under uh, 706 to impose oh, the telecommunications act of 1996 yeah, yeah uh, to impose 
this uh, regime where you, you can't have this situation where Comcast wants to promote its, uh, its own music uh, service, and so they squeeze the pipes for iTunes. Or, uh, and you can come up with a, a hundred different other uh, sort of variants of that. Um, their political right. podcast is going to get the, uh, the preferential tubes, whereas the majority report is going to get the thin, reedy, hollow tubes. Uh, well, I guess you want your tubes to be hollow in that situation, but no, you don't. And so there, w- there was a court case. Uh, the first court case, um, when they were sued, their scheme basically failed. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it failed, and and you know, I believe it's failed on a number of occasions. And they keep trying to go back uh, without doing this reclassification. Uh, And now, essentially, what Wheeler has done is say, I give up. You can go ahead and price differently. You can can have content providers pay more for a fast lane on the Internet to reach their subscribers and their their viewers and and, and audience. And I, I, as the FCC, will will monitor this and ensure that this is commercially reasonable, which is a very vague term. Uh, as, uh, you know, if, if to uh, essentially, I guess, prevent gouging is the theory, but there's, there's, there's not much teeth behind I, I don't see how there are any teeth behind that, because it, we're already in a situation where Verizon has successfully sued in court uh, to, to break down uh, the FCC's attempt to, to regulate under the information service uh, under Section 706. And, and, and I, I would just see this as, as Comcast or as uh, the FCC just crying wolf again and again and again, saying, well, you, you better not be unreasonable about this. Uh, and then, you know, the goalposts get moved on what's unreasonable. And uh, who knows? what the FCC can actually do in that at that point uh, once they've already opened up the floodgates and, and allowed for discrimination. And it is discrimination because if I am, if I have the choice of two restaurants and one of them offers this, this free and clear uh, driveway for me to pull up into, and the other one I have to hack through a mile of jungle, uh, as a as a someone who wants to eat, I'm going to go to the 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 restaurant that is more more viable for me to get to, and that's what you're going to see. And this is attractive not only to the ISPs who get reward out of this financial reward, but it's attractive to the large content providers, people like Google and and Comcast, who can then sort of muscle out or narrow their competition because right. they're they're the only ones who can afford to pay for the fast lane. All right, so let's let's focus on that that part of uh, your, your to, you know to your restaurant metaphor. Mm-hmm. So for for them, the the incentive here is they the incentive is to even actually for them as uh, as the the behemoth, okay, the uh, the chain restaurant to say to say we're willing to even spend even more. Then we would want to, because if we effectively raise the cost of creating this sort of pristine driveway to our restaurants, yeah. it's actually going to keep the little mom and pop restaurants from from being able to engage in that. So their incentive is perverse here because they would actually be willing to pay more because it will bigfoot uh, the smaller restaurants. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is different than how some of the other fights over Internet content discrimination have gone. Uh, the, the big fight of a couple years ago was over uh, an anti-piracy law called the Stop Online Piracy Act. SOPA. And in this case, SOPA. And uh, Hollywood was trying to get this passed, the music and movie industries, uh, so that ISPs would have to take down websites whenever there was a subjective copyright claim made by the movic, music movie industry or whoever had a copyright claim. Uh, and in that case, Google and, and, and some of these other content providers, the big ones, had a reason to want to stop that because they couldn't possibly police their sites 24 hours a day, seven days a week to see if there was 
some copyright claim that was put on by a user, uh, you know, most of these sites, Twitter, Facebook, or user-generated content, uh, this would be detrimental, severely detrimental to their business. So they worked in common cause with activists who wanted to keep the Internet free and open uh, and ultimately took down the Stop Online Piracy Act. It never even got a vote. This is a different situation because you might not have that common cause between activists and large tech firms who might see it in their interest to create a fast lane that only they could use. So, all right, let's. I want to. I want to return to that because that talks about the sort of the dynamic of the fight that is uh, in front of us here. Uh, but, but I want to also turn to the other half of the equation in terms of allowing. Um, uh, providers to provide that pristine driveway, and that is the the other side of the coin, which is the the jungle that one would have to wade through to get to the restaurant. Uh, under Wheeler's pr- uh, proposal, uh, pres- uh, presumably there would be a baseline, so it couldn't be a right. a jungle. It would have to be just sort of like a. I mean, I guess presumably it would be like the thicket that exists now, maybe. Uh, right, but as we move, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, th- I don't know that there's a baseline in terms of some sort of, uh, you know, megabit speed or anything that that the FCC is going to sit there as a floor. I, I, I think that that the the idea is that nobody could be discriminated against, and if everybody is on the same crappy slow lane, then no one is necessarily being discriminated against. But you have to look at this in terms of market incentives. You know, we have uh, far worse broadband uh, in this country in terms of speed than many other countries in the world. Uh, The World Economic Forum puts the U.S. 35th in broadband speed. And one of the reasons for this, the telecoms, uh, Comcast, AT&T, say that they just don't have enough, they can't afford the build-out of faster broadband. And so if they're, pay, if they're getting money from large incumbents to use a fast lane, they're going to invest in the fast lane. They're, right. they're going to ensure that there's a premium there, that there's a real difference between uh, a fast lane that, that is paid for, uh, that, that you can get lightning quick downloads and lightning quick load times on your, on your Internet websites, uh, versus... The slow lane, which will just become slower, there is no incentive for the telecoms to upgrade anything on the regular Internet if there's this faster Internet that's being paid for. You want to make it attractive, presumably, for companies to pay for it. So so there, it's clear to me that uh, not only would this discriminate uh, you know, one set of content against another, but that Internet top speed times on the vast majority of stuff, not Google or, or Netflix or whatever, whoever's paying for it, uh, the, the, the load times for the free Internet uh, will be slower. I mean, it's just, it's just very clear that that's what would be the result of it. I mean, it, it functions almost like an anchor, right? I mean, assuming, sure. best case scenario, that it says, okay, it cannot get worse than it is today. There is no there's no sort of impetus to make it better at all. And it, it, it freezes almost the the vast majority of the Internet for those without the, the means to to buy that high speed lane. It freezes it almost in amber. Right. I mean, we're so we are stuck. Yeah, and, with, and, and and I don't see that the FCC even does any sort of research into those speed times anyway. Like, I don't, I don't think the FCC has at its disposal you know, uh, 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 I don't even know what to call it, a thermometer or something where they can judge uh, speed times from a, on a day-to-day basis. They, they just don't do that. That's not part of their, their purview. So uh, we're going to get this information from the other people who, who you know, perform these, these tests. But uh, for the FCC just uh, – it, it, it doesn't operate that way, which is why that – the idea that they can micromanage and regulate every part of this, make sure it's commercially reasonable, that's just not traditionally, that has not been the FCC's job in stock and trade. I, I, so I, I don't see them suddenly upping their game into this 
this regulatory agency that can that can micromanage each little content deal between uh, a telecom and a, and a service and, and a content provider that they're going to be able to make sure that everything is commercially reasonable and everyone can get the content that they want. It just just doesn't seem seem viable to me. I mean, even in the rosiest scenario where they say uh, that the way that we're going to fashion this aspect of what is reasonable in terms of a, a, a floor for that lower Internet is that it has to be at 75 percent, let's say, or whatever. They pick some percentage right. of the speed of the high-speed uh, um, uh, highway. So as the high-speed one gets better, uh, this one necessarily has to I- increase. But that seems just unlikely. In that instance, all it will do is it will provide sort of a, a, a ballast or anchor on on the the high speed internet and so we'll be stuck always in this position of having a subpar internet relative to the rest of the world and for those right. people who don't have the ability to pay it'll be a sub subpar internet or a subpar par internet and and two other things that are important here one uh innovation is crushed by by this this possibility because the large incumbents will have this this demonstrated advantage over anyone who wants to be a barrier to 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 jump into this this market. Think about what the internet looked like five years ago, and think about it today. And most of the names that 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 you hear about today, uh, many of them weren't around five years right. ago, are, are certainly not around in the in the in the version that they are right now. So. Uh, none of those 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 ones that weren't around five years ago would be around in the next five years under the the this scenario. The incumbents would have a, a huge huge competitive advantage over anyone trying to to be a barrier. And 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 the internet traditionally has has evolved uh, in, in very quickly uh, with a lot of innovation uh, because of this concept and principle that everyone's content gets served at the same speed. That, that's a huge reason. And the second thing I want to point out is that if you have these incumbents who are paying for the fast lane, who's going to pay for that? The customers are going to pay for that eventually. It's going to, it's going to you know, trickle down. So you'll be paying more for Netflix because Netflix is paying more to their Internet service provider to get that faster speed for you. So ultimately, and, and the, to the, the end, the individual is paying here. And with the end of making sure that there's no Netflix competitor, right? I mean, that's exactly. the, so so, the internet is yeah. You know, the internet uh, uh, individual user is paying for the monopoly mm-hmm. created uh, by by this two tiered internet. Uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a, a ridiculous situation. All right, so let's. Uh, there's there's two things here. Uh, one is some of the pushback that we're seeing is that this has got to be something that Congress deals with, as opposed to the reclassification. Why, when I read, whether it's on Vox.com or uh, some piece in National Journal, or I listen on NPR, and they say the FCC just can't reclassify because it opens up a can of worms. What's in that can of worms? I mean. I I should say, let me rephrase that. What are those worms? Right. The worms are Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon, and all their money. That's the only worms. Now, The the, the FCC could reclassify tomorrow. There is nothing stopping them. They could even just say that there are two sides to Internet broadband, the, the part where you call and the part where the Internet service provider responds, and they could just say that the response has to be uh, without discrimination and as a common carrier. Uh, that is Tim Wu's proposal. Tim Wu is the guy who invented the term net neutrality, is a professor, and uh, that, that is a proposal that he made to the FCC that Mozilla, among other uh, uh, Internet companies, have, have embraced. So... There so so break that down for us. What does that mean? What does do that this. what does that distinction mean when I call as opposed to when they respond? I mean, what is tell what does that mean in practical terms? In practical terms it means that anytime, you know, 
you know, the call and response is mainly the call is when you type in Netflix.com. Okay. And, the, and that goes to the Internet service provider. The response is the Internet service provider saying, oh, you want Netflix.com and then bringing it back to you. So the response could be common carrier. The call could be an information service, and, and maybe that's a, a different scenario. But largely when you're looking at it in that form, uh, the content would be uh, neutral at that at that level. So that's a way to do it. But reclassifying is the easiest way to do it, and it can be done. It's the fact that cable and, and wireless and, and, and phone services – have lots and lots and lots and lots of money, and they've invested in members of the FCC uh, who once were lobbyists and now are working for this federal agency, and they, the can of worms would be that these incumbents, these, this telecom industry, wouldn't like it. Well, uh, now- they might try to sue, and, and, you know, we've seen how that goes. And maybe maybe they would have a point, but uh, the the D.C. Circuit, uh, even in their ruling, offered a path w- by reclassification for the FCC to get the rules that clearly uh, they they seek. So people so should understand there, that, that is, the court the court itself said you guys should just reclassify. Said here's the path, take the path. And and, and so let me ask you this: It's a fairly obvious question, but are those worms? Uh, to belabor this, are those worms any less vir- virile, I should say, in terms of getting Congress to simply amend the Telecommunications Act and say it's, <laughs> right, right, it's right. a common carrier? I mean, that's the thing I don't understand. Like, the answer is Congress, even though Congress is just as bought as anything else. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the idea that it would be somehow easier to go through Congress uh, than to go through a federal agency's rule writing process is, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that's been borne out by history, uh, re- certainly recent history. So it's it's silly to throw this back on Congress and think that that's, that's somehow an easier lift or an easier process. Uh, the FCC has the ability to deal with this. Uh, they, they, the, the Congress has done its job in the 1996 Telecommunications Act. It, it's merely a matter of updating that for the times, and the FCC has it within its power to do that. And so when you use the uh, analogy or you, you, you sort of explicate the, the fight, the SOPA battle, uh, and say that the, the, the sides, uh, those who line up uh, for and against this are a little bit different now, who, if, if activists are looking for an ally, and this, again, is one of those situations where it's the battle between industries, and the best that we can do yeah. as uh, little peons is to sign up on one side of the, that battle. Who, who's on our side? It, it's, it's unclear at this point because there really hasn't been— uh, a, there's been a lot of silence on the part of Silicon Valley in the days— since Chairman Wheeler's proposal came out. I mean, certainly Google, which, which is an ISP uh, through Google Fiber, is probably not going to be the leader of a movement uh, against ISPs being able to charge for faster content. Uh, Netflix has been probably the most vocal uh, firm out there and, and offers an opportunity uh, it's a sad comment that activists have to think about which business they have to right. lobby in order to get uh, the public interest served on the FCC. But that's where we're at. And uh, and the reality is that it will take. Yeah. The reality is if you're a content producer like myself or if you're someone yeah. who uh, puts, uh, you know, videos up that are not um, YouTube, if you're, I guess, um, uh, Vimeo or something like that, you're just not uh, a- a- as big of a heavy hitter um, uh, to, to sort of marshal those forces. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that the, the smaller groups can, can you know, take, take a little more risk because this really does threaten their business model and their survival. Uh, but it's probably going to take one of these these big groups to to step out and be fairly true to their word. I mean, the Internet Association, which is the large kind of umbrella group, has paid lip service to supporting net neutrality for years. 
uh, they, they now, now there is this mortal threat to it, uh, and they need to do something about it, and uh, they, they need to sort of follow uh, the principles and ideals that they have professed for so many years. Well, uh, I guess uh, time will tell. But in the meantime, people uh, can—we've got uh, all sorts of resources on uh, majority.fm where people can email in their comments. The the comment period is open for another couple of weeks. The decision, I think, is going to be made in May. Um, Well, yeah, let's let's clarify here. So May 15th is when the FCC will have a public meeting to determine whether or not to go forward— with the notice of proposed rulemaking. And that's what these rules are. That's the stage that they're in. They're proposed rules. So even if they go forward, even if they vote to go forward on May 15th, that begins a comment process and the rules do not get finalized for many months thereafter. So this is going to be a long fight. And uh, May 15th is really just the beginning. But if you can stop this thing before it gets started on May 15th, that would obviously be preferable to uh, having to drag this out longer and longer and longer. And, and so um, groups that have engaged in this demand progress, roots action, I mean, there there seems to be a lot of groups out there that are doing this. It, I mean, it does. Uh, it, it, are, am I naive to think that it does actually help to, to sign a petition and send in comments? I think it does in this case. Um, uh, and, and particularly, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the large firms, uh, the content providers, will be looking to see how much public outcry there is because there is ultimately maybe some reputational risk mm. that comes with being silent. Uh, it, it, it's, there's going to be a need to show a major pushback here in order for the coalition to be built to put a stop to it. it that, that just seems like is what's going to have to happen. And so, uh, you know, I don't sign petitions very often, but in this case, uh, any, any, anything you see out there, it's, it's probably a good idea uh, to uh, let the FCC know exactly what kind of a backlash uh, this sellout will have engendered. David Dayen, always a pleasure. Now, if I want to sign up, for your email that you send out uh, oh. weekly that tells me what you've written, uh, what, uh, where do I go to do that? Because um, Absolutely. I'm one of those people who uh, I like getting all the stories from my favorite writers in an email, uh, and you're okay. one of them. And, uh, so where Thanks. do I go to get that? Yes, so you go to tinyletter.com slash David Dayan, all right. and you can subscribe there. It just takes a minute. And let me let me offer this. Why don't you buy David Day and newsletter dot com redirect? That's not a bad idea. And uh, I need you as my business manager. So no, I you don't. Believe me, buddy. On a consistent basis. No, you don't. But, but uh, I appreciate <laughs> you coming on and talking to me about this. <laughs> Thanks a lot.